the world economy is uh, heading for some very big trouble. If the U.S. and China decide to carry out their multi-billion dollars threat threat, a tit for tat that could happen on July the 6th. And that's the one on one side. Before that, OPEC uh, oil ministers are meeting this Friday. And already there are a lot of uh, fraction within the cartel between Russia uh, one, and, and, and Saudi Arabia on one hand and Iran on the other, including Iraq, about how to move with the forward production uh, quota that will be discussed at the meeting. In the meantime, Donald Trump, the U.S. president, has joined the OPEC uh, uh, meeting from the outside, throwing out some tweets that the U.S. lawmakers should move ahead quickly and enact that no OPEC, that is no cartel of exporters and price fixing anywhere in the world. That law, if passed, will allow the U.S. to sue any government anywhere in the world who tries to come together and fix uh, oil production, including the price at which products are sold. That's the big story. Part of the big story we're tracking for you this week. And all of this come together when we're discussing that hot bowl of rice that you may be having for breakfast, lunch, or dinner today. You've got to think about, uh, most likely, the poison in that bowl of rice. That's just what the agri-minister says. That here is not the agri-minister, but this is uh, Dimo Kwesa, one of the research analysts at Financial Derivatives Company. Good morning, Good morning to Mr. these very hot, looking very delicious plate of rice. But the agri-minister says, and we've heard it severally, that it could be poisonous. Now, there are a lot of burning issues in this stormy world of business right now. And it looks like we are cascading towards July when there will be serious crisis. Already we're seeing that in the stock markets around the world. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. I think global trade trade issues are dominating the, the meeting discourse today. I've seen domestically Nigeria complaining about smuggling, persistent smuggling from most likely Benin. I think that was what the country that the Minister of Culture was referring to. And well, compared when we talk about the price, the price of rice has actually come down drastically from this time last year domestic produced rice. However, compared to two, three, four, five years ago, it is still nowhere. That price is still ridiculously high. I think that would continue to be a problem because number one, for one, Nigeria's rice is not competitive in terms of both quality and quantity. Both quality and quantity. For one, for example, a Nigerian farmer would have to transport rice produced in the northern areas at a factory, factory gate price of, let's say, 14,000 naira. If we now ask the premium price. Hold on a second, I'm going to, I'm going to just stop you there. 14,000 naira per yes, bag at yes. factory gate? Yes. So how much does it get to me? If you now ask the premium from transporting the price from these northern areas, which well, has from Kebi, which have been riddled yes. by Boko Haram, Herdman crisis, and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. If you now add that premium, and now goes up to about 15,000, 16 naira per bag. On the other hand... If we produce it locally, how yes. come we can't have it at 5,000 factory a, a, a price that transportation premium that premium that is added no no you haven't moved it yes from the farm why should it cost fourteen thousand at the farm it is simply not competitive and secondly like your previous guest said our yields we produce nigeria's yields rice yields are one of the lowest in in the world for example a country like thailand has about three four harvests a year nigeria has just one harvest of one, one rice harvest a year sometimes two if we're lucky but so that is an indication of how uncompetitive com by yield. So technically, are. what happens to the yield? Is the soil, the climate, the fertilizer, the what? There's not not enough input, not enough training and innovation has been provided to these farmers. But we do need irrig irrigation. It only started recently through this Ankos Ankos Boras program, whereby whereby training facilities, inputs are provided to these farmers on credit. So it's only just starting. We're, not, we're yet to see the benefits of this. But it's a progress. It's a step in the right direction. But it will take time. It will take time. If you look at the number of states in Nigeria that should grow rice, mm -hmm. about half of the country, technically yes. speaking. Yes, yes, indeed. I so if we, even if we have a single production season in the country and we warehouse and whatever, in silos and whatever it is, we should have... A moderate pricing, not seventeen, eighteen thousand per bag. That's correct. That's correct. And but let's not overstate the positive impact of this the government's policy on rice production. Rice production has increased dramatically. Rice investment into rice has also increased. We're seeing But smuggling is still, it's still big business. It's still, it's smuggling still of issue. rice. Yes, yes. So I think as long as we have 
our tariffs on rice is at sixty percent, and Benin's tariffs on rice is at twelve percent. That incentive to capture higher prices in the Nigerian market will continue to. But I've grow. always wondered why don't we just go straight to Thailand and say, bring the rice here directly to Lagos Seaport, Wari, Port Harcourt, Calabar, right? Yes. Then we can just decide what to do. Okay. It's still surprising how we allow Thailand, how Benin Republic talks to Thailand mm. directly as a small country and sitting next to us when we have all it takes to have that direct conversation yes. with Thailand and say, fine, we just want it here, but this is the quantity we want, and this is the quality that we want. Then we put a tariff on it. Yes. Then we just shut Benin Republic or Togo, whatever, out of the game. Yes, an interesting statistic. So it's statistic. difficult for us I found as a government yes. To talk to Thailand yes. directly. Nigeria's imports from Thailand have reduced, like you said, 97 percent. That's Ports, what government officials say. Nigeria's Benin Republic's ex Thailand's exports to Benin Republic have almost doubled since then. A country of 10 million people can't be importing that much, can't eat that much rice. So where does that demand go to? So uh, a country to, of 10 million people yes. is taking Nigeria, a country of 180 million yes. people to the cleaners. Yes. Just because exactly. of bag of rice. Yes, exactly. Yes. Is, is uh, the, now, <laughs> let, 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 let's go to the markets. I uh, was trying to, uh, yesterday we spent more time talking about trade mm. and whether we have what it takes to really handle what you call the trade war. We've tried with chicken, with uh, turkey, right? Yes. And then we had rice, then we had cars, then we had tires. We fought this trade all the time in smuggle, in smuggling. We haven't been able to win any. We have not been able to win. I think it is also, this is now the time we can take advantage of this trade disputes between between Nigeria, between the US and China. China but and Canada and the rest. Because of our limited capacity in producing some of these agricultural commodities, we can't take advantage of this. For example, wheat. The US China imports a lot of wheat from the US. But Nigeria would be in that perfect position to so supplying wheat to China, but because we have limited capacity to do that, we cannot do that. We cannot produce enough to export to countries like China. So this is, we're not taking advantage of this trade dispute. And it's only escalating and escalating. It's not going to, it's not looking like it's going to settle down anytime. Any, so. any, anytime soon. 